committee for Monday, October 20th, 2014. I'm Paul Krikorian, chair of the committee, joined by my colleagues, council members Englander and Bonin, and we are ready to begin today's agenda. Uh, members, if there's no objection, I'd like to take items three and four as consent items to note and file uh, those items. Good with me. If there's no objection, uh, that'll be the action of the committee. Um, and then uh, for folks who are here uh, in, the, in the room, if you'd like to offer public comment either about any items on the agenda or within the jurisdiction of this committee, please fill out a white card that are available in the back and bring it forward. Um, we're going to go first to out of order to item number five. So let's go ahead. Uh, item number right. five is the Bureau of Sanitation report relative to a proposed plan for the citywide abandoned waste cleanup. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Javier Polanco, Bureau of Sanitation. Alex Halu, uh, Bureau of Sanitation. Leo Martinez, LA Sanitation. Lisa Maury, LA Sanitation. I just wanted to take this opportunity to showcase all the uh, hard work of um, the collections operations headed by Leo in uh, cleaning the, uh, some of these alleys uh, throughout the city. I just have an example up here of this uh, one alley in Council District 9 uh, with the leadership of the City Council and the Mayor. They found it necessary to rid the city of accumulated blight after years and maybe decades of uh, neglect uh, by opening the door for LA Sanitation to tackle this daunting task. Uh, with your approval to move the $5 million from the unappropriated balance LA Sanitation budget, we can uh, preserve the gains we've achieved through the cleanup efforts over the past fiscal year. In the short term, LA San commits to stopping the bleeding, continuing to chip away at the edges of this problem so that, at the very least, it doesn't grow any worse. In the medium term, after obtaining key metrics on quantities and types of service requests and responses, we can develop a baseline data to report the adequacy of the resources committed. Um, LA San can determine the level resources to operate in maintenance mode where major accumulations, like what you see here of debris, are mitigated, and we are fixing that broken window in quicker order. In the longer term, we're we want to add a campaign with a clear, consistent message to city residents to uh, prevent blight from forming. Uh, that would also be a key, uh, key to success. Uh, city services don't come more basic than uh, cleaning up the sanitary conditions of our communities for the benefit of uh, public health and safety and economic development. Um, and so we pulled about, uh, Leo's crews pulled about 55 tons out of this uh, one alley over three days. Um, so with that, uh, I'll just, just want to make sure the video works. So uh, just, just scroll back to the beginning here. And just to give you some background on our bulky item program really quick, um, LA Sanitation provides a bulky item pickup of household furniture, mattresses, uh, and appliances. Res residents can call the uh, 800-773-CITY uh, number to obtain services to uh, schedule by appointment the collection of those bulky item uh, services throughout the city. Um, much credit is deserved to um, uh, Councilman Cedillo and CD1. On July 2nd, he started the, uh, we started with him uh, forming a comprehensive, comprehensive program to address blight and abandoned waste uh, in CD1. Uh, LA San uh, initiated a pilot program offering dedicated and enhanced sanitation uh, services. Just some before and after pictures. Uh, see on the right how we try to leave the uh, alleys uh, broom clean after we finish. This is an example of an abandoned waste location in the, uh, the foothill area. Mayor Garcetti and the City Council allocated $5 million in the 14-15 budget to LA San for citywide cleanups of abandoned waste. Uh, the funds were allocated for removal of abandoned waste in alleys, maintenance of alleys after an initial cleanup so we can maintain them in a clean state. 
and to remove abandoned waste uh, from sidewalks. Just a bit about the schedule. Um, each of the council districts would be provided uh, one dedicated uh, day of service per month. Uh, that amounts to, uh, since there's uh, 20 working days for the two teams that we would deploy, deploy we would have uh, 40 days to work with. So uh, one day of dedicated service for each of the council districts, and that would leave a balance of 25 days to to uh, service the dis the other districts as needed, so that because uh, a lot a lot of uh, urgency comes about when there's a cleanup that that's needed uh, right away, or if it takes more than several days to clean up uh, a site, then at least the uh, council districts would still maintain their one dedicated day of service, and we can get to the, those other uh, service requests that are are more uh, problematic. We're also maintaining, uh, with the help of the community services group, a, a Google Doc spreadsheet uh, that we work closely with the council offices with to, to make sure we coordinate with them on the higher priority uh, uh, service requests for, uh, for cleanup. Um, and so it's uh, interactive, and they, they, they could uh, work it out so they have a priority, have their priorities set for what areas they, they want cleaned up. It's just a uh, an example of the schedules we'd have. Each council district would receive, again, one day of service, and as shown, and for services that fall on city holidays, the council districts would be serviced the, the next business day, and the work week may be extended to Saturday to compensate for holidays. So uh, that's just examples like on a normal schedule uh, in October and uh, November when there's there's more holidays and there there have to be adjustments made to the schedule. We also want to develop a, a, a program similar to uh, CompStat that LAPD has so that uh, we would re be reporting on the number of service requests, the, the frequency, how much tonnage we collect for e each type of service uh, uh, cleanup that we have so we could better attract those statistics and uh, be able to concentrate in those areas that that are the most you know problematic and prioritize our, our service this is the this is the uh, position request that we have uh, we have we basically have two teams uh, two teams uh, having Three maintenance laborers on each team, three refuse collection operators on the team. We have a wastewater collection uh, worker. Uh, those would all be uh, vacancies along with the management analyst, too. Um, we're asking for resolution authorities for the supervisors. That would be the refuse collection supervisor, solid resources superintendent, uh, the chief compliance inspector, and the environmental uh, compliance inspector. <coughs> So it's just a breakdown of uh, the existing vacancies we're requesting to have uh, filled through the uh, Managed Hiring Committee. Um, on the left is the existing vacancies, and on the right, the resolution authorities that, that, that we're requesting for you. This is a breakdown of the uh, $5, million, $5 million uh, request. Um, we have $1.3 in salaries, and uh, there was some... Um, Contingency that was able, we were able to to realize in that uh, when we first estimated the budget, uh, the, there was uh, the cap that we originally used. Uh, we use we use the the more updated cap now, and uh, we're, we're, we have some contingency for for overtime and contractual services and operating supplies because that's where we we spend the most money. Uh, in tip fees and uh, contractual services like clean harbors uh, and, and, and over time as well because we, we want to keep the uh, crews out there if they're in the middle of a cleanup and it's late in the day instead of pulling them off and redeploying them we can keep them there to to proceed in, with uh, finishing finishing the job that they start that, 
that uh, I don't know if you have any uh, questions. So. Yeah, I, I have a few. Just first of all, on the budget itself. Thanks for the presentation. Um, this is, I think, we all are eager to get started with this kind of a program, and that's um, why we've pushed for this since the last budget. So um, it's. Uh, it's a good step forward. On, on the breakdown of the costs, uh, I'm a little confused by some of the um, some of the budget, and I just want to have you explain this for us. <clears throat> First of all, the ex, can you explain the modified Cap 35 indirect costs? Because in the first memo back in August, that was identified as a 3.3 million dollar cost. And now it's 1.9 million. It's still more than the salaries. So, what is that? Why is it fluctuating so wildly? And why is it still more than salaries? Absolutely. Um, the the good news is when this was prepared before, we were inadvertently double counting some of the things in in the cap rate. Uh, what the cap rate covers uh, it would be fringe benefits, things like pension and health care for the employees. It also covers uh, a lot of central services that are provided to us, such as fleet, uh, maintenance, um, fuel, a variety of other things. So the good news is we were double counting the first time, so that freed up some money to go towards more providing direct services. It is still more than 100% when all of those um, items are, are rolled together, all of the central services that the rest of the city uh, provides to us, as well as the, the fringe benefits. It is more than 100%. So it, it is correctly represented as being more than, than the salaries. Because this is work that can't be paid for by our special funds, we need to make sure all of those costs are, are recovered. Well, okay. And then the breakdown of the columns there shows a SWERF column and an SPA column. So is the expectation that that one point, the 4.4 .4 million is coming from the SWERF? Uh, what that's representing is how much it's going to be reimbursing our two funds that we're using for this program. Okay. The majority of this program is coming out of our, our solid side of the house, so that's the 4.4 that will be reimbursed by the general fund. Um, on the SPA side, um, they're providing support work, for instance. Uh, we've got environmental compliance inspectors that will come out if the crews discover there are potential hazardous wastes there, or if, as part of an alley cleanup, um, there is uh, there are homeless people there, they'll come out and, and trigger the protocol that's associated with that. So, what the split is representing is the the reimbursement that's going back to those funds. Okay. So the tip fees similarly um, went from 114 to 966 presumably because there was money that wasn't going to be spent on the cap rate that was now freed up to do something else with. Correct. But aren't the tip fees going to be a direct function of the number of hours worked by the two crews? Absolutely. And the, the reason that that changed is the, the five million um, was not developed organically. Um, it was the amount that was given to us, and our direction was give us the best program you can with $5 million. So we had identified um, that would be enough to fund the two crews, and then essentially whatever was left over went into tip fees and, and the other expenses. Uh, we thought at the time it was probably pretty low and we might have to come back, um, but because that was freed up, um, that gave us the opportunity to correct that and, and put in tip fees that are more in line with what we're really expecting um, based on the amount of tonnages we expect our crews to be removing. Okay. And $600,000 for contractual services is anticipated to be spent how? <clears throat> the bulk of that we would expect to be spent for our uh, Clean Harbors contract um, they're the folks who, if we do discover hazardous wastes out there, um, get called in to make sure that that's properly disposed of. Okay. All right. Now, in terms of the specific positions, what role does, does the wastewater collection worker 
play in in this sort of cleanup um, and then as a general matter I, I just I'm wondering if we have two teams of 12 uh, uh, cleanup workers and another position and a half for wastewater collection it's 13 and a half positions it seems a little top heavy to have three four three four five supervisorial positions for those 13 and a half positions so I'm just wondering what the rationale is for that level of supervision over two crews on the wastewater uh, workers um, in this program what we're really looking for is direct interaction between our team which is made of six people and having one superintendent overseeing it as well as one supervisor the feedback we've been getting councilman is that the since these two individuals are going to be coordinating the cleanup activities throughout the council offices so this way they're going to be as the council offices have the access to the Google Doc and they're documenting it um, and they're filling up um, the information on that Google Doc, the, the job of the superintendent and the supervisor is to close the loop, say, we collected this area, this is how much tonnage was collected, these are the documents we have, and then they can put it into the Google Doc. So this way, let's say on the first Tuesday, CD2 would know we're going to be cleaning, we have that day available for us to clean up. So CD2 will go in, the, they populate the document, say, this is the area we want the crew to clean up that day. The, the supervisor, superintendent will basically oversee it. They'll make sure uh, they evaluate the area, they assign the crew, and then what they complete the loop. On the wastewater, what we have noticed in the one-year study that we have done is that we do need people to go out and do uh, cleanup. For example, use high power washes. So the wastewater crew will be cleaning up the area, pulling out all the remnants of whatever waste there is. So, and the supervisor, um, you mentioned the chief environmental inspector. We recognize that one position would probably be too much for that function. So we divided the time 50% between here and the other 50% on the Venice because the council has allocated 3.8 million for Skid Row, another 500,000 for Venice, and this 5 million is outside those two. So the supervisor, compliance inspector, will be able to look at this one bag and tag, put the stuff in, you know, document it. So we have, we felt this is enough or adequate staffing at this stage to do the bag tagging, cleaning, flushing, collecting of any wastewater or any material that's in the alleys or the sidewalk. So that's how we designed the program based on what we have learned in the last year of doing it in CD1. Mm -hmm. And we're doing CD and other council offices. But this is, really, this is really the program that where we in the sanitation working with the council offices to develop, you know, uh, with the needs, address the community. And we felt that the council deputies who has their, uh, they know what needed in the community and which areas need to be cleaned. And that's why it's really very important to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection. We did not want to use the existing, we don't have really, existing resources kind of stretched to the limit. So that's why we're asking for these new positions. Okay. Members, Mr. Bonner? Uh, I got a couple of questions. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't start out by saying thank you to, to sanitation. Uh, you guys have been a godsend, not just since the start of this fiscal year with the, the Venice money, but throughout. Uh, you have just day and night because I know there have been cleanups at, at three in the morning I just I just really want to thank you because you've been doing a, amazing work and some of it is amazing and very disgusting work uh, I've seen what you've picked up I've seen the photos I've been out there for one of them uh, just thank you for that um, I had a question about the the the, the sand stat program and I think I understand, but what the purpose of that is going to be in terms of determining future deployment? Is it going to be where the greatest number of calls are will determine where you'll deploy resources for the coming period of time? Is that a different point of information or a 
superior or inferior point of information to the feedback you're getting, going to be getting from the council staff? The council, yeah, when the council approved the five million, they wanted us to really follow what LAPD has done with the ComStat, and how successful that program has been in identifying certain areas where we can go on target. And so they directed sanitation to work with LAPD and come up with a program similar to what um, had been successful. We are looking at it as, as we're building this program, we're looking at which areas has the most dumping, what um, things we could do in those alleys to target them, what things we could do on the sidewalks and others that people have been illegally dumping. And in our briefings with the council offices, they all wanted to know, they want to see each area with, with pictures and tonnages. So this way they can put the ratio one to one or one to three, they need to move resources over here. This area is clean, we don't really need to be having uh, bins or something in this area, relocate them over here was being used. They, and that's why they asked us to come back within six months really with that report. It really came from council and they, you had specific instructions how to develop the program. We are starting with the Google Doc, which was mentioned, but we really want to be building on it, working with LAPD and add other things that the council will find very helpful. At, at the last uh, committee, at the other committee meeting, they also uh, wanted us to work to, with LAPD. That was one of the recommendations in regard to creating a volunteer surveillance team to aid in, in combating illegal dumping. So we think if we have the statistics and have some mapping of, of where it's occurring, we'd be, it would be able to direct uh, right. I mean, the, the reason I asked about the, the, the stats and the volume of calls is I was actually thinking of uh, Mr. Fuentes' district. I know that he's done some cleanups in the Tahunga Wash before right. where there's been a lot of dumping, and I would just, I would assume that you probably don't get the same volume of phone calls because it's not as visible than, than you would in a more residential area, and I just wanted to make sure we don't create a system where that would fall off the, the list of, of being taken care of. Yeah, the, the request would include both from council office and, and phone requests, so they, you know, they, the council office request would be included okay. in, the, in the statistics. Uh, th then I had a question about sort of the, um, the presumptive application of the Levon protocol. Uh, there are areas of my district where if one of my constituents or one of my staff calls in uh, a couch on the side of a street, I think we presume that it's an unattended belonging and we go through the prior posting and notification. I assume that there are other parts of the city where you get a call for an abandoned sofa or a mattress and you just go out and pick it up. Where and how do you determine that you're going to make that presumption that the Levon protocols are applicable? You know, the, two weeks ago, actually, on a Saturday, we got a call about there's some waste in front of a residence in West L.A. And when our crew were dispatched to go clean it up, they found a homeless person between the trash. And so we had to go through the whole process of posting, the, putting the notice, although we could see literally there's trash everywhere around it. And then we were able to talk to the individual on a Sunday, we'll go back again on a Sunday, and he agreed certain items to be removed because he said, no, I don't need these things, but these are my personal. So it's really case-by-case -case basis that we, are, we evaluate because we got sued so many times. Right. So we and, have and, to be... And, and I, I assume that there's many cases where there is no one present. Uh, so the, the, the question is, when do you determine that something is unattended and you need to do Levon versus abandoned. I, I know that the city attorney would, would, would have an opinion, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how is it that the couch in the alley in Mr. Price's district gets to be picked up and then there are other places where you determine, no, we need to do the protocol? Council Member, this is uh, Leo Martinez, Division Manager for the LA uh, Cleanup Crews. Uh, typically, the rule of thumb is there's somebody there at the location or adjacent to that location, uh, we then consider that an encampment. If the individual has belongings and anywhere near where the cleanup program is. So if we go to a location and there's no one there, uh, we will just continue as normal. If we run into a situation where you see somebody in the, in a, on a couch or a mattress or adjacent to it, uh, typically we will then back off and go through that process. 
Okay. Last question, um, park property. Uh, if something is left in a, in a park, if someone leaves something in Banning Park in CD15, uh, you know, an old television or an old, so, old sofa or something like that, who's responsible for picking that up? Is it Reckon Parks or is it sanitation? Uh, park and Rec. Reckon Park. That's with, fair. Yeah. with this program, though, we also have, if the council office for that day that's allocated would like to us to, to help out the Reckon Park, that day is basically the council office day. So it's like, you know, Angie's List where you can hire somebody for uh, six hours a day or something. This is the program, is that that day is really for the council office. And if you know, you would like us to help a record park, we would be glad to do it. Okay, thank you. Mr. England. Great, thank you so much. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you for putting together what I think is one of the most important things we do as a city in quality of life issues. Uh, these are issues that become hotbed issues for crime uh, and deteriorate communities. There's no question we've got to do something and uh, do more than what we're doing now. In fact, in my district, we've got scores of groups that um, have decided to get together and, and, and take it upon themselves to do something about illegal dumping and cleaning up. Uh, we had out of, and they've actually named their groups, Northridge Sparkle, for example, uh, which has done a phenomenal job where they go out there not only each and every week, but they've taken it a step further to plant and build flower boxes, to bring in public art. Um, we've got areas of Northridge, Northridge South, Northridge East, Chatsworth, West Hills uh, that has regular cleanups where they bring the residents out, where we supply the materials, we supply the pickup, we supply um, the garbage bags, all of the things that they need. We promote it, uh, we partner with that in getting other people involved. There's a lot of schools that need um, credit for their, for their students in civic participation, so they get out there. We've got a cleanup schedule this weekend with the, um, with the uh, Boy Scouts. Every year they come out and clean up all the trash out of Stony Point mm -hmm. Park. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, community activity, and I realize there's other areas that certainly need a lot more uh, than just CD12 that um, are beyond what even local neighborhood groups can do. And it really uh, is uh, two, a tale of two cities. But having, having said that, and I, th and I thank you for taking the approach strategically to this, I do have some questions um, that uh, my colleagues have asked, but I wanted to just do a slightly deeper dive on in terms of some of the costs and the bang for the buck, if you will. And that's what I'm looking at. Um, it was stated that uh, it would require $600,000 for contractual services, and you got into the details, but I haven't seen a draft contract. Is that something we pay out and have them on standby and pay whether we use or not? Is it something that they only bill if we use the service? Uh, how does that work? And do we have a draft of that contract? We do have a Clean, clean Harbors uh, contract, and it is usually billed bill for service. It's billed per service, not, right. they don't just no. It's just not an annual fee that we keep them on standby, but it's per service. Okay. So um, we have to call them out to help us clean. After the inspectors go through the area and, and tag where the hazardous material is and some other, so we call them in for that one. Okay. The supervisor, as you mentioned, I, I do have the same concern uh, that was shared earlier, that I think it seems like it's very top-heavy uh, with a lot of oversight versus the actual folks that are doing the work. A supervisor, and, and, and this is sort of back of the napkin, but a supervisor checking Google Docs at half time at $130,000 salary a year, even at half time once a month for a council district, is, is roughly paying somebody $65,000 a year, if you will, if you use that math, um, to check what the council offices are already inputting uh, and verify. So I, I have concern over, over what we've done with staff but just overall, in the total cost of, of, the, of the program and trying to boil that down, um, we're talking about a $5 million, it's an annual $5 million, is that correct? That's correct. And with that, it would be one dedicated full day, though, full day for each council office a year, a month? One dedicated day with 25 floating days that we will be, will be using. So there's two teams. Each team is available 20 days a, uh, a month. Total is be 40. And then 
uh, minus 15 days, which is one dedicated day per council office, this is the bare minimum, leaves us with 25 days, floating days that we will go throughout the city. Throughout the city. With, so with concentration, as was discussed, as was as we were instructed in the budget, to be concentrate on highly impacted area in the city. Those how the 25 other days were listed in the budget. Instruction to sanitation. Okay, so per council district at five million dollars, if we just broke it down in basic math, that's three hundred thirty-three thousand dollars a year, um, and for that one day, if you will. So the floaters. Uh, we have floaters. In fact, my office, my staff goes out. We have a rapid response team that if we get a call on a bulky item pickup on any given day, we're out the same day picking it up, um, as, you, as I think you guys are, are aware as well. Uh, we don't call in for bulky item pickup. Uh, we try not to, to use sanitation or, or whatever departments because it might take a day or two, which is a great turnaround. Um, but we, we, we try to pick things up same day um, whenever possible. But that would equate to about $28,000 a day for having that one day cleanup. And I know, if, and I don't know if there's other options or if there's some kind of menu that various council office can pick or choose from, <clears throat> but um, at, at that kind of dollar amount, $28,000 a month, um, we, can, we can do a lot in CD12, certainly, uh, more than a one day cleanup. And, and I'm not sure if there's some other options that, um, Council offices can can tap into the funds and say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna host three, four, five of these a month, and partner with neighborhood councils and community-based organizations and schools and churches and synagogues and so a lot of things we've already been doing, but we're short of funds and staff on that we can get a lot a lot out of um, through those synergies. And I'm not sure if there's some other options uh, if we're just looking at it as one program citywide and that's sort of take it or leave it, or if there's some flexibility there. You know, council member, the, the, the schedule is designed so that every council office gets a minimum of one day a month. There's flexibility built into the program so that, for example, if we go into a, a, a cleanup, it may require two or three days. Our crews will be there to clean. Uh, and if we do clean it in one day, we'll look at where the, uh, we'll look at our docks, what are the uh, priorities of the council offices, and we'll move our staff around to address those priorities. So you essentially could get more than two or three or four days in a month, depending on the flexibility and what's happening in your district. Okay, so I guess the question then brings me to another question in your answer. Will there be an opportunity to approve this and work though with sanitation separately to say, instead of this one month or instead of a one day full crew with all these supervisors and staff, we'd like our resources to be dedicated to, we're gonna do three, four, or five of these, but we're gonna bring in our own community-based organizations. We need material, we need equipment, allocate some of the funds towards that, or is that, is that, will that be an option? I'm not sure I understand exactly what your request is. Can you repeat that again? Rather than focusing on perhaps one area or one cleanup on a day in a council office and having just the department doing all the work and, and the council office or the community turning in the request for that work. Instead, perhaps we can work with the communities throughout our council offices, throughout the district, to identify multiple locations, either for that day or for a couple days. Oh, certainly, yes. There's, you know, it could and be then we more, pick more, up the more throughout the month, if you will. Oh. Right. Yes, certainly we do that. That's what I'm looking for, some, right. some flexibility. And right. You're right. I mean, CD12 happened to be one of the... You guys have very aggressive program. You work with the residents, with the communities, and you pick up the stuff. We have other areas in the city. What I can tell you, we can spend a whole week just cleaning up one alley. Yeah, and oh, I know. A lot of materials is, and this I is. I, that's why I identified that early sure. on in my first comments. Um, and then, lastly, the one thing that you mentioned is a Comstat type program. Um, do we pre-deploy uh, for bulky item pickup now? For bulky item, when the residents call, we schedule for the next collection day. Right, no, I'm saying do we pre-deploy? In other words, we don't wait for the phone call. We anticipate, so we know, for example. We, ha we have two programs. We have, the, when the residents calls us in, we tell them to put it at the bulky item on the next collection day and we pick it up. We also have sweeps that we, a part of the multifamily bulky item program, which is the different fee, where we do sweeps in the area. Um, so we do have those two, plus we have uh, nonprofit organizations who go out and they do collection and then they ask to bring the material over to sanitation 
to one of the sanitation yards or to our transfer station. And so we work with the council offices on that to cover the tip fee or something else. And the example is So we have multiple up, programs really out there with the community. Is for those of us that have um, large universities in our districts, and uh, every time there's a semester is up, mm -hmm. there's small refrigerators and couches and desks and beds and mat all over the, uh, the community. And we've got to organize and, and, and get people involved and engaged. Those are something that we know with certainty on a specific day or a weekend is going to happen. It's seasonal. Mm -hmm. It's been that way for years. There are many locations throughout the city that have that. And yet, um, oftentimes, we find ourselves you know, getting the calls, getting the complaints, trying to track down resources to get folks out there. But we already know it's going to happen. Right. So pre-deploying services, particularly around those areas, um, and in my example of CSUN, we have the largest university in the state of California with 42,000 students, 50% um, of which actually live on, on, on or near campus now. And that number keeps going up every, each and every year. Every time a semester ends, um, and not just the year ends, but a semester, because everybody's on different cycles, including summer school, you see that huge um, volume uh, of pickup that's required. And, um, and so pre-deploying services instead of using overtime when we know for, with certainty it's going to happen, they're going to be there. Uh, we can put out large bins and do other things proactively around universities. Uh, we we do that all the time. We like do that with UCLA as well as USC. Uh, like you mentioned, with the, uh, when the semester is over, the students just put their stuff out in the street. So we, we know the areas and we do deploy crews you know, knowing that. Plus, maybe we'll work with the university about reusing some of these, uh, especially the refrigerators and stuff. We have a great program with LA Shares and others. Maybe we can pull some of the stuff and reuse them. Great. Instead of just like take to them out to recycle. Well. So we could work with definitely with your office councilman on that one. Okay. Thank Pre you. Pre-deployment. Okay. Thank you. I just want to clarify a point because I think um, I heard a cross conversation here. Um, Mr. Englander was asking about flexibility uh, to use some of this funding, as I understood it, mm -hmm. f to create flexibility, uh, to utilize uh, community groups to provide maybe services to those community groups other than, uh, not just in addition to, but other than the two six-person crews. Um, I don't, and, and I know that there's flexibility in working with community groups, but that's not provided for in this budget. That's not provided for in this proposal at all, correct? Correct. Okay. So um, to that point, I'm going to take a, a step back and, and kind of identify the, the problems, the big problem areas of bulky item uh, uh, pickup. M most of the items, at least in my district, and I suspect it's true in many parts of the city, you can identify the places where you know that there's going to be illegal dumping all the time. You clean it up it's that way again in a week. And the, the reason is that in those areas, they're being used for truly illegal dumping by business people or by contractors or by others who, rather than paying a tipping fee, dump it in a wash or dump it in an alley or, or a street. And you know that spot, and it's going to be there every single time. You know, loads of tires from the garage down the street, those, those sorts of things. There's also, separately, the issue um, of the person moving out of their apartment or their dorm. They put their couch out on the street, figuring that mommy's going to pick it up. Um, it's, it's just like putting out the trash. They maybe don't even know that the city provides a free service for bulky item pickup. Um, but they just put it out there, and they figure it's somebody else's problem now. And then there's a third big category, which is this, the homeless kind of skid row situation of encampments and so on, where you have a, an entirely different set of issues in responding to it, uh, as Mr. Bonin alluded to, uh, with the Levon protocols and everything else. So in my view, part of this program, for it to be successful, there has to be an education component. There has to be an enforcement component, not just the, the cleanup itself. Uh, because without that follow-on enforcement, you you will never get to the root of the problem of that illegal commercial kind of dumping. 
and without the education component, you'll never reduce the outflow of things from the apartment dwellers and the, co and the dorm dwellers who are moving out. It, you know, without getting some outreach into them to let them know that it's a phone call away. You don't have to dump your couch. Just call 311, we'll come and get it. Um, so I'd like to see some of that built into this program as well, particularly on the enforcement side, because it's a great frustration for me, a great frustration. And, and you guys do a magnificent job, and, and let me just echo my, my colleagues' comments, a magnificent job. And we also work with nonprofits, with community groups and everything to try to supplement the work that you're doing. And when you get an entire community together and you bring in city resources and people are working overtime shifts and you entirely clean up a whole area, and then you see it looking pretty much the same way in a month, that's, a, that's maddening. And you know that it's people taking advantage of this system and people who almost feel emboldened to do their illegal dumping because they know that you're going to come and clean it up. So it makes room for the next illegal dump. And so without that enforcement component, we're never going to get to the bottom of this. So what are your thoughts about how we can do that? You know, what can we do with those hot spot areas other than putting up, you know, Q-Star cameras and stuff, which, you know, we, I don't think, I don't know if we've ever achieved a, pro, a successful prosecution for one of those. Maybe you would, you know, Mitch, on an illegal dumping. I've tried many places putting the cameras up and everything, and, and it's not a deterrent, frankly. So what are the ways... the cameras. Yeah. So what are the ways that we can get to the, the bottom of that, both the educa better education in our multifamily situations and better enforcement with that illegal alley dumping and wash dumping kind of situation? With regard to the uh, public outreach, we understand that is a key component to success of any program. We've done that with our multifamily program. We want to go ahead and, and, and have crews out there like LACC, go out there door to door, knock on residents, let them know there's not additional cost, you're already paying for it, it's just a matter of picking up the phone, understanding what our process is. With regard to the, um, the actual the enforcement and inspection, it's really, really difficult to prosecute someone. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of inspectors uh, work with us from street services in our multifamily program. And in the last, uh, the four years that they were with us, we didn't have one single prosecution. It's very difficult. You've got to catch him on hand, not, you know, after the guy's driving off, while he's unloading. You know, we're, trying, we're thinking about maybe possibly working with LAPD and, and doing some stings in certain locations and trying to make some kind of deterrent. Uh, there's been some discussions with other council offices with regard to uh, purchasing some surveillance cameras, like you mentioned. Uh, in some cases, that may deter. In some cases, it may not. It's a very difficult issue. It's not an easy fix. We're trying a lot of things. Some are working, some are not, and we're just going to keep working with it. Yeah. One thing also, Councilman, we found successful in CD1. When we cleaned up an area, the council office themselves sent letters out to the residents, knowing that this is the area was being cleaned up, and they sent letters to them saying, we just cleaned up this area. If you have any questions about bulky item pickups, any material you want to get rid of. So that was part of the campaign that the council office brought into the table. Um, and uh, like Leo mentioned, we are working with CD7 and others about figuring a way to catch those people who do illegally dump it. But a lot of it we find out people are um, we have a lot of transit people coming in and leaving and sometimes they have to leave a building for whatever reason and they end up the owner taking it, dumping it. So we're working with the associations for the apartment buildings about providing them with posters that they can put inside their building to tell the resident move in, move out, it's free, done by the city. So we have a lot of these small programs but I also want to mention that when we started this program in the beginning was really modeled of what eight council members asked us to come back with a program similar to what successfully was mentioned in the LA Times and other media about the CD1 experience. Mm -hmm. So when, when we came back, we came up with $25, $26 million, and I was the one bearer of the bad news that we need $26 million, teams in each district, strike forces everywhere. Anytime somebody drops something, we go pick it up. And of course, you know, that was not thought of well, with this budget of the city, this is too much. Right. So that so the council gave us $5 million to do this, this program, and we figured with this scale down, we can still do a big change and be able to do a difference. 
And that's why we really would like your support on this as we go, so this way we can really prove it's working. And we, we can tweak it along the way, but we really would like your support on this program. Okay. Uh, anything else, Mr. Bonin, Mr. Englander? Um, CAO's office have any thoughts about the cap rate issue and whether that's a, an appropriate level of um, it, it? It is an appropriate um, uh, methodology that we, we use. We actually use it for every, um, every other aspect of the special funds noted here. So I think it would be uh, we want to keep it consistent with how um, we reimburse and vice versa. They reimburse us for, for services. Okay. Um, there's always a true up that's conducted at, uh, at some point to ensure that um, you know costs are being appropriately charged back to the funds and vice versa to the to the general fund as is, as in the case of the lifeline program um, th there are some clarifications though with the recommendations in the report that I think are, are required um, number one uh, with respect to to the authorized positions uh, that's recommendation number three it's it's our understanding that all these positions have ever have already been um, approved and, and are part of the Sanitation Bureau's budget, and they're also already part of the blanket unfreeze. So there's no need for these position, this recommendation moving forward as that's already been the action that has already been taken on these positions. As to the current vacant regular positions? The current regular positions and the resolution positions, I understand, are also already authorized under the, the Bureau's um, position count okay and then on um, recommendation number two with respect to the funding of the moving the funding from the UB to to the sanitation's budget uh, since um, it's been brought up a, a, in a couple of different ways we actually would suggest a, a, a change to that recommendation um, in, in essence since the budget uh, as proposed in this in this program has been established on a reimbursement basis we would actually ask that the uh, committee consider uh, moving the, the funding from the UB to a GCP account, and then similar how we, similar fashion to how we uh, the sanitation invoices us for Lifeline and for other programs that are within the GCP. We would do a similar reimbursement basis, uh, so that it allows some flexibility for changing the program in the future, if, if that is the case that council wants, an action council wants to do. But it would be a single account. It wouldn't be a. It would be a single GCP, GCP account. GCP exactly. Account. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Um, and so we can go ahead and authorize that transfer to a GCP fund. Exactly. It would. It would be expended though as. Yes. Yeah, so so the, uh, maybe add add to this report uh, an instruction to our office to work with the bureau. On establishing the reimbursement schedule uh, in similar way that um, other, other programs have been established where they invoice us on a either as part of the FSR or on a on a quarterly basis that meets your concern yeah okay I, I think that's a that's a good amendment mr. Bonin sure okay uh, that'll be the action of the committee as a as amended thank you very much thank you appreciate it thank you And excuse me for clarification, then the committee is concurring with the Energy and Environment Committee on recommendation number one to approve the plan, the Clean Streets Plan. As to item number one? Yes. As to item number two, it's as amended. By Correct. the recommendation of the CAO, and item number three is not necessary. But. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yeah, um, Mr. Bonin, the appropriation limit, item number two, is should be non-controversial. So, if that's yep. okay with you, we'll approve that one on consent as well. Well, on the consent of uh, <laughs> chair and a member at this point. Um, and then that will bring us to our closed session item as the last remaining order of business. Um, is there anyone wishing to offer a general public comment? 
Seeing none, general public comment is closed. Is there anybody wishing to offer comment on item number one? Seeing none, uh, public comment on that item is closed as well. I'm okay with the city attorney recommendation. I'm okay with the city attorney recommendation. Don't want to have a discussion. About it. Uh, let, let's just spend a couple minutes okay. since Brian is here just to see where they're at. Sure. So, um, okay. And we're now back in open session, and there being no other action before the committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>